Hey everybody, it's your old pal Robert from thrillride.com. How you doing? So today I'm visiting a museum I've wanted to check out ever since it opened. It's very new. This is the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures and it's all about the art of film. Uh, museum LA has been hoping to install for quite some time. Uh, so we finally got it. Really, really excited to go take a look inside. Uh, there's four floors of stuff to see. The fourth floor currently has a Miyazaki exhibit, which I dying to see. Unfortunately, there is no video or photography there, but I'm sure there's plenty more cool stuff to look at. So let's go take a look around. Just looking up at the back side of this big uh, structure, this globe. And right underneath here is this Walt Disney Company Piazza, I believe they call it. A place to congregate and hang out. And uh, the shade. And yeah, the main entrance is right across the way. So here we go. Well, there's the uh, mission statement for the museum. The Academy Museum advances the understanding, celebration, and preservation of cinema through dynamic and accessible exhibitions, screenings, programs, initiatives, and collections. Nice. So just inside the main entrance, get a look, they have a little, looks like a bar and restaurant over here called Fanny's. And uh, these red kind of pillows to hang out on. And there's the check-in desk and one of the first exhibit spaces in the back. And I love back here, they've got the Academy Store, which we'll uh, peruse later. But they, looks like they managed to save one of the original Amoeba Music Record Store neon signs and uh, have preserved it here. <laughs> I don't know if you know, Amoeba Records was a Hollywood legend. I should say it still is. It did close in its original location, but it has reopened, so that's a good thing. And well, there's another famous name right down on the first floor. We've got the Spielberg Family Gallery and an exhibit called The Stories of Cinema. All right, cool. There we go. Motion pictures, more commonly known as movies or films, are the world's most popular art form, encompassing many aspects of visual and performing arts. This is really great. They have some uh, film clips from seminal moments in early motion picture history. And that classic bit of Buster Keaton. So great. <laughs> and there's Frankenstein in the background there. Awesome. Yeah, so many of the sort of cinematic storytelling techniques that we take for granted now, like cross cuts and reverse angles, all the ways we visually tell stories, somebody had to invent. And uh, a lot of the stuff we're looking at right here are some of those inventors. Yeah, there's just so many famous moments from classic films here and there. It's really fun to see. So the Stories of Cinema exhibit is actually the main kind of presentation in the museum. It takes up three floors and it's gonna be constantly shifting and evolving as time goes by, but uh, this little gallery here, kind of an introduction to some of these, again, classic moments of this. Oh, look at that, there's a Forbidden Planet. <laughs> it's like a, is that Seven Samurai over there on the left? Yeah, amazing. All right, heading up to the second level. Ooh, this exhibit called Backdrop, an Invisible Heart. Designed to merge seamlessly with built sets, they create wholly believable environments on screen through a skillful use of paint on canvas. This is pretty cool. So we're in a room that is uh, focused on the uh, backdrop painting that was created for Hitchcock's classic 1959 film, North by Northwest. And Hitchcock apparently really wanted a chasing on Mount Rushmore. So they use a lot of interesting cinematic techniques to make that work, including this massive painting. Look at that. And that's got to be three stories tall, easily. Yeah. 
So there it describes how they would hoped to shoot more exteriors at Mount Rushmore, but they ultimately decided to film scenes and background footage and then recreate the location at the studio with the painted backdrop. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's been too long since I've seen this movie. Really is a classic. And I do think it's great that they acknowledge the uh, controversy about the, uh, this particular monument and its relationship with the uh, land that we basically took from Native Americans. Yeah, they're describing this new stagecraft LED technology from our good friends at ILM, very heavily involved in the use of the new Star Wars TV series. Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett, both awesome by the way. All right, so we're on the second floor and continuing the Stories of Cinema exhibit. There we go. Yeah, not gonna lie, science fiction, big, big part of my movie watching experience and horror movies as well. <laughs> I'm very much appreciating this uh, selection. This is a nice little primer on the components of movie making, acting, animation, casting, cinematography, costume design, directing, editing, executives. <laughs> you do need executives. Makeup and hairstyling, marketing and public relations, music. Oh, I think that's important. That should be higher up the list. Producing, production design, very close to the end, screenwriting. That hurts a little. Sound and visual and special effects. All right, so this gallery features six narratives highlighting movies and movie makers. Here to find is the artists and executives who collaborate to make movies that have made significant contributions to cinema as a vital and ever-evolving art form. Well, you can't go wrong with uh, Citizen Kane. Without a doubt, one of the greatest movies ever created. Boy, that's pretty amazing. I don't think I've ever seen the original movie poster for Citizen Kane. And it's still hard to believe Orson Welles was, what was he, under 30 when he made this movie? Yeah, there we go. Oh, there it is, yeah. Orson Welles was 25 years old when he left the world of radio to make his debut feature in RKO Pictures. There's there's no stronger debut motion picture than Citizen Kane. That's, that's absurd. <laughs> Optical effects artist Lidwood Dunn's most innovative contribution to Citizen Kane was the hypnotic traveling split screen that suggests a camera moving through expansive interiors and exteriors and holy crap there it is rosebud apparently this is one of three sleds that were created for the scene in which rosebud is thrown into the furnace orson wells didn't like the first take but loved the second and the third sled survived wow so this is the only surviving rosebud <laughs> sorry for the spoiler everybody but yeah rosebud is his sled I just learned something new. So on the left is a copy of one of the work, two working screenplays that uh, Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles used to uh, shoot the film. And it bears the original title, which was going to be called The American, or Citizen Kane, based on the life story of William Randolph Hearst. So cinematographer Greg Toland used these uh, Bausch & Laum camera lenses to uh, create a kind of deep focus technical approach that allowed both the extreme foreground and the background to remain sharp. I love this concept drawing for Xanadu, Hearst Mammoth Estate. And here up above is a still from the movie. All right, the next film highlight here is Real Women Have Curves from 2002, directed by Patricia Cardoso and is celebrated as a cinematic landmark for its nuanced and sincere portrayal of working-class Mexican-American family. Awesome. So these are uh, some various uh, pieces used in the production, uh, a map and a kind of a design drawing. Part of, I guess, a section of the film that takes place in the Garcia Textile Factory. I've actually not seen this film. Now I'm curious to uh, check it out. Yes, uh, locals always say living in Los Angeles is like living on a big movie set because the city itself is used all the time uh, for various uh, movie and television projects. And of course, 
this film relied quite a bit on LA locations. And it's cool, they discuss how they lit East LA with warm palettes of pinks and oranges and colder blues and grays to dominate the scenes in West LA. Yeah, it looks like that image on the wall behind this display table is the uh, textile factory. I'm not going to college. What do you mean you're not going to college? You're a smart woman. You have something to contribute to this world. You certainly can't talk about influential uh, filmmakers without talking about Thelma Schoonmaker. Working with Martin Scorsese for most of her career, she's edited all of his films since Raging Bull. And those include The Aviator and The Departed, for which she won the Academy Award, all well-deserved. And I gotta say, I mean, I love most of Scorsese's films. But for me, Goodfellas, that's the perfect movie. There is not a frame, a bit of music, a line of dialogue, an acting performance, not a single thing I would change about that film. It is my favorite film of all time. And there she is at work, I think, on her first picture, which was... Uh, the Woodstock documentary from 1970. Yeah, what a career. Now yeah, she's she's amazing. Oh man, and look at this old uh, editing station back in the days when still working with film and tape. <laughs> yeah, this is a flatbed KEM editor, and that is analog, man. I mean, yes, Goodfellas may be my favorite, but there's no denying Raging Bull is also a straight-up, stone-cold classic. Just a masterpiece. <laughs> oh, De Niro, you're the man. So here's a filmmaker I'd never heard of before. Oscar Michaud lived from 1884 to 1951, was a writer, director, producer, and distributor of more than 40 films, both silent and sound. He was born to parents who were former slaves and went on to become the most prominent African-American filmmaker of the early 20th century. And he independently produced what are known as race films, employing black cast and crews to make films for black audiences who routinely found themselves excluded, stereotyped, and vilified in mainstream movies. Boy, he was more than just an auteur. In addition to writing and directing his films, Michaud oversaw the business aspects of the creation, promotion, and distribution. It was a segregated theater in Hannibal, Missouri, 1912. So much cool information here. So in 1920, Michaud made a film called Within Our Gates, which is regarded as an answer to D.W. Griffith's 1950 blockbuster the Birth of a Nation, a film so heinously racist that it sparked a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. So Michaud's debut film, The Homesteader, from 1919, was adapted from his autobiographical novel of the same name. It's one of several books in which he fictionalized his transformative experience of leaving Chicago in 1905 to become what South Dakota's first few black settlers. So here's a room that celebrates uh, Mexican cinematographer Emmanuel Lubezki, and apparently his poetic and technologically innovative approach to cinematic naturalism has made him a highly regarded collaborator of directors Alfonso Cuaron, Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu, Inaritu, sorry, and Terrence Malick. So as well as being a cinematographer, he is also a still photographer and records a lot of the production of his films, and these are all taken from cast members of The Revenant. I still haven't seen that film. I should. A lot of people told me it's it's not easy to get through. Them. <laughs> it's pretty graphic. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a prolific uh, artist. Worked on Sleepy Hollow, Malik's The Tree of Life, The Aforementioned Gravity. Oh, You Too Mama Tambien, Children of Men. Yeah. And this is a film I've never heard of. Carne e Arena, visually present, physically invisible. Huh. Oh, it's a conceptual virtual reality installation. Cool. Well, this is a very unexpected and happy surprise. They are also celebrating good old Bruce Lee. That's badass. <laughs> I've always been a martial artist by choice, an actor by profession, but above all, I'm actualizing myself to be an artist of life. So Lee received his first nunchaku 
from training partner Don Inosanto in the mid-60s and quickly mastered the weapon using it in many films. Oh, that's some serious nunchuck action. <laughs> oh, it's such a sad thing that we lost him so soon. So this is one of several different kinds of suits of a similar style that Lee wore in Enter the Dragon. And it is apparently a stereotypical Tang Zhuang jacket. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. But instead of featuring frog fasteners, it had round buttons illustrating Lee's signature fusion of Eastern and Western tradition, a constant theme in his work. And as a detail I never, ever, ever would have noticed. And of course, uh, some spectacular movie posters, including these two here, End of the Dragon and Game of Death. I'm not a Bruce Lee expert, but I gotta believe those are two of his most popular films. And then, uh, looks like Chinese posters from The Big Boss, Way of the Dragon. I did discover on Netflix a movie, I think it's called Return of the Dragon, which was made after Bruce Lee's death, starring somebody else, obviously, where he goes to hell and fights Clint Eastwood, James Bond, and Popeye, among other famous real and fictional characters. It is psychotically weird. <laughs> Here's a trading card from the Green Hornet, a show from the 60s that introduced a lot of America to Bruce Lee. Um, wow, a fight sequence drawing by Lee choreographing the whole thing. So cool. And there's a script with uh, drawings by Bruce Lee. That's a pretty awesome dragon. Nicely done. Yeah. In early 1973, while Lee was filming Game of Death, he was churning a drafts of an article he wished to publish in my own process. There's something I didn't know. Born in the Chinese hour and year of the dragon, Lee became synonymous with the creature. What do you know? And there it is. He died just a month before the release of End of the Dragon at 32 years old. Due to an allergic reaction to medication. Ah, such a tragedy. Here's an exhibit on the history of the Academy Awards. Cinema's preeminent honor. And of course, the statuette I just walk away with is known as Oscar. Oh, well, here it is, the uh, Oscar Mary Pickford won for Coquette in 1929. And they've got Oscars for uh, all kinds of different professions, actors, and here's one for visual effects, given to John Steers, John Dykstra, Richard Edlund, Grant McCoon, and Robert Blalack for Star Wars 1977. Yeah, well deserved. Well deserved indeed. And kind of the last three over here on the other side of the uh, rotunda, we get the best animated feature film for Shrek on the right. In the middle, uh, Alfonso Cuarón's directing award for Gravity. And then here at the end, Academy Award for Adapted Screenplay, won by Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alvin McCraney for Moonlight, 2016. This is my family who's supporting me for the rest of much of the time. I give the strength to all of those oh, This is great, a whole wall of uh, acceptance speeches. And when you think it's impossible, just remember a pretty the big central table with uh, what I'm going to see, I'm sure, are all kinds of Oscar night memorabilia. Oh, this is great. So, yeah, you walk around the perimeter of the table, and there's a whole timeline on the history of the Academy Awards. We never imagined this to ever happen. You're so happy. <laughs> Oh, this is great. Here's a thank you telegram from Ben Hecht, winner of Original Story Underworld, Hi, to Academy you. Award President Doug Fairbanks in 1929. <laughs> Boy, Western Union telegrams. So that black and gold dress on the right was worn by Rita Moreno when she attended the Oscars in 1962 and won uh, for Best Supporting Actor in uh, West Side Story. Uh, it's a pretty big uh, part of Academy Award history, 1970. 
the Midnight Cowboy becomes the first X-rated film, although later re-rated to R to win Best Picture. Yeah, also Stone Cold Classic. Well, I'm having a little trouble finding some explanatory panel that identifies who and what this dress is <laughs> over on the left, but that's a, that's a pretty bold fashion statement. Yeah, I like it. So it ends here in the 2020s with uh, Bong Joon-ho winning Best Picture, Directing, and Original Screenplay for Parasite. So we got a whole room here celebrating the accomplishments of Spike Lee, who is formerly known as Shelton Jackson Lee, born 1957. Yeah, I know he's a controversial filmmaker, but after seeing Do the Right Thing for the first time, uh, I was kind of on board. And uh, his output, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it consistent, but he certainly is an auteur and a filmmaker. And when he's good, he's incredible. Yeah, if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna look for movies to be inspired by, you got a good collection here. Rashomon, Taxi Driver, Spartacus. <laughs> and a couple of I have not heard of. Giancarlo Giannini's Pascalino Setebaledze. <laughs> and of course, Spike Lee's films do address racism very implicitly and explicitly. I gotta say, Bamboozled, not one of my favorite of his, but there's a moment in that movie that is so gut-bustingly funny, I stopped and rewatched it maybe 10 times when I first saw it at home. <laughs> whatever film it is, whatever the subject matter is, whether it's a documentary or a narrative film, the connected tissue is that it's coming through me. And so here's where it all starts, story. Screenplays and storyboards show how cinema is first born on paper. Yeah, it takes an army of different disciplines to make a feature film, but it all starts here. Wow, there it is. A script annotated by Nicholas Pileggi for Goodfellas. Oh, that is that is a document I would like to own. That's, that's fantastic. And at the moment, her name is slipping my mind, but the editor who worked with Hitch on Psycho was once interviewed and she described having to work on that infamous shower scene so many times that she would no longer take a shower unless her husband was at home with her. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. So here's a section of the exhibit talking about adapting books for screenplays. And I realized that Wonderful World of Oz, Frank Baum's children's book, went through a lot of rewrites but I didn't realize that at one point, the infamous slippers were going to be silver, not ruby. Huh, I'm gonna change things a little bit. Yeah. And again, it's always funny to remember that when it was first released, The Wizard of Oz was kind of a turkey. And only in subsequent years and showings on television did it finally get recognized as the classic it is. So it looks like they are going to use The Wizard of Oz as kind of a case study to illustrate how all these different kind of skills come together to make films. <laughs> casting and performance, yeah. I think Spielberg said casting is about, if not 80% of a movie's success, it's the majority of it. And I think he's right. So here's something I didn't realize. Quite a few directors put their stamp on The Wizard of Oz. Uh, a director named Richard Thorpe took care of some early test footage. George Cukor came out as an advisor. And uh, let's see, Victor Fleming directed the bulk of the project, but then he left to go shoot Down with the Wind. And uh, King Vidor came in to shoot the uh, Kansas City sequences, or rather, King Vidor directed the Kansas sequences, including Over the Rainbow. And even uh, producer Mervyn Leroy directed a few transitional scenes. A little fun connection to theme parks. So Mervyn Leroy's son, Warner Leroy, the restaurateur who created Tavern on the Green in New York City, also created sick, or what was then just Great Adventure, a Great Adventure theme park in New Jersey. I love this elevated still from the uh, production showing the huge sets they built. And there's uh, Dorothy herself in the center. Look at the 
Zero Set. Now, according to another information uh, card, the uh, art directors on this project did not use any of the book illustrations as a reference. They completely imagined Oz uh, fresh. So what you're seeing here, all of these visuals, are not inspired in any way by pre-existing works. Here's some original uh, production art created by sketch artist Jack Martin Smith, working under art director Cedric Gibbons. Of course, costume design, very important to uh, any film, but particularly fantasy filmmaking. And here is a uniform worn by uh, William Giblin as a munchkin soldier. And then here are the uh, dresses worn by uh, Judy Garland as Dorothy Gale. Also, quite iconic. I mean, you look at those, you know exactly what movie they came from. So, this is one of the only surviving props from the Tin Man. Apparently, his costume is thought to be lost. But uh, actor Jack Haley uh, was gifted his uh, oil can. And uh, <laughs> apparently what it scored was not oil, but chocolate syrup. Movie magic, baby. And apparently a woman by the name of Blanche Sewell worked in the editing department and was handpicked by producer Mervyn Leroy to edit The Wizard of Oz due to her infallible grasp of the emotion picture. I like that expression. Yeah, and of course, many filmmakers will tell you, you make a movie twice, you shoot it, and then you make it again in the editing room. Can you believe that? So, that iconic song, Over the Rainbow, won the Academy Award, but was temporarily cut from the movie after test screenings. Oh, can you imagine? That movie without that song. <laughs> Incredible. So traditionally, matte paintings used when you can't build a life-size set because something is just too huge or impractical to build. They were painted on with oil on glass. For the Wizard of Oz, storybook style backgrounds were drawn in pastel crayon on a black cardboard. And here is a look at that painting. A photograph of it, obviously. But yes, and all the areas in black were then kind of comped out and filled with live action footage in uh, multiple exposures. You really can't talk about The Wizard of Oz without talking about Technicolor. And, uh, and then in 1932, okay. this process was still relatively new when they were starting to make The Wizard of Oz. And I love this particular detail. Technicolor cameras required such intense lighting that the Southern California Edison Company installed a small substation on the MGM lot. And standing right in front of maybe the most famous still image from the Wizard of Oz of the four of them on their way to the Emerald City are the ruby slippers. Pretty cool. Indeed, hair and makeup super important in so many ways, but what was interesting for The Wizard of Oz was that Jack Dawn, pioneering head of MGM's makeup department, wanted to create looks that would create all these fantastical characters, but allow the humanity of the actors to uh, come through in their performances. And look at some of these early concept sketches. And here's another little factoid from uh, the movie's history. She was originally conceived as blonde and, and of course and performance Dr. that's really the was the, producer on it. We the final linchpin of uh, any great movie <laughs> to get it safe because we actors we were really kind of like bring it all together had auditions and we finally got it I didn't realize Laura Dern was I only 17 when she was cast in David Lynch's Blue Velvet so when it comes to uh, actors and films, the story of Eric Stoltz in the uh, original Back to the Future production is one of the one of the great head scratchers. So yeah, Michael J. Fox was the first choice to play Marty, but he was locked into his TV series schedule for Family Ties. So director Robert Zemeckis tried with Eric Stoltz and realized it just wasn't working. He needed uh, he needed somebody with a more lighthearted uh, take on the character, and that's what they got. And the rest is history. John Waters is another one of my favorite people on the planet. I love this quote. She left Kansas and ended up in Hollywood. 
the message to me of this movie is continue traveling, get on a spaceship, go to Mars, go anywhere in the universe and get a look at it. Right on. I'm very sorry to say I've never seen The Wiz. I really need to correct that. And again, just a little sex on the marketing and publicity. <laughs> that was a pretty uh, minimalist poster there in the center. Interesting, never seen that look before. And here's a whole room dedicated to identity. And I guess celebrating the uh, key creative collaborators that include the costume designer, hairstylist, and makeup artist that help an actor to bring a character to life. Oh, here's a little outfit worn by uh, Shirley Temple. So this incredible, I hesitate to even call it a costume, it's more like sculpture worn by an actor, but appears in the final sequence of the horror movie Midsommar. Came out in 2019. I have not seen that yet, and I've really been meaning to, and now that I know this dress or costume is involved, <laughs> I'm more intrigued than ever. Oh, and here's that very creepy uh, outfit and pair of scissors from uh, Jordan Peele's movie, Us. I didn't love that one as much as Get Out, but it certainly had moments of abject terror. <laughs> and here's some costumes from one of my favorite films, modern films anyway, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Beautiful. <laughs> now there's a costume that is as recognizable as just about any other in modern cinema. <laughs> It binds. So here's an exhibit on uh, makeup and hairstyling, and I love these busts up here. Okay, the first one I would not have gotten, Grace Kelly, but then you got Clark Gable, Mel Brooks, and Don Cheadle. <laughs> That's great. I wish they were about to come alive, like the heads in the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, somebody's got to get a little uh, projection mapping going on here. <laughs> yeah, here's something a little more to my taste. This is a makeup worn by Leonardo DiCaprio in the red, and I guess scars from his bear attack. And here is part of the development of the uh, mask for King Cobb in the 1976 film created by Rick Baker. Nice. Oh, and I love this mermaid costume one worn by uh, Scarlett Johansson and Hale Caesar. And that is a Coen Brothers movie that I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. One of my favorites of theirs. And really a love letter to cinema itself too. Great, great movie. All right, here we are up on the third floor and the backdrop exhibit continues here. Along with something called the path to cinema and the Oscars experience, but <laughs> lurking above the stair or the escalator to the next floor, there he is Bruce. I don't know if that's the Bruce, but it is a representation of the famous Shark and Jones. Also, one of my favorite films of all time. Well, this is cool. So yeah, there's a balcony upstairs where you can get kind of a elevated view of Mount Rushmore. This is great. So this is the space is looking at all the various forms of visual entertainment that were kind of the precursors of a film. Richard Balzer from lived from 1944 to 2017, collected pre-cinematic devices for over 40 years, amassing more than 9,000 objects from around the world. Of course, shadow play is considered the oldest form of projection, one of the earliest forms of visual entertainment, from puppets in Indonesia to hand shadows in Japan and France. And here's something called a camera obscura, a pinhole camera which is an optical apparatus in which an enclosed space of any size from a small box to an entire room is pierced with a small aperture through which light passes, projecting the scene outside. So when I first read Peep Shows, my mind immediately went to the more modern and slightly risque uh, version, but Peep Shows back in the day were these kind of boxes that people would peek into to see uh, realistic scenes of cities, festivals, military battles, etc. But then you were given this impression of depth through mirrors and a magnifying lens. And what's really incredible is that apparently some of these had front or back lights so you could transition from day to night and magically reveal what wasn't visible before. And that is considered the earliest form of cinematic dissolve. Incredible. 
Yeah, and you can see it's sort of like a multi-plane camera. There are these various uh, kind of frames of uh, scenery. And one way they create the illusion of depth in these uh, peep show boxes was to do or create what were called perspective views with very dramatic lines of perspective to bring your eye deep into the image. Yeah, and that was just a nice fade from day to night. Look at that. Oh, that is super cool. And back to day. Yeah, there you go. The earliest form of cinematic dissolve. Brilliant. So magic lanterns is a term new to me as well. Like cinema, the magic lantern is a medium of light. In fact, it is one of the earliest projection devices. They emerged in the 17th century, and astonishing effects were later introduced with multiple lenses allowing one image to dissolve into another, and levers or rotating mechanisms to set the slides into motion. So this is something called a triunial lantern, or triple lantern, which allowed seamless dissolves from one slide to the next. And here is a poster for something called Clark's Ghost Illusion. And that very show may have used something like this called a Phantasmagoria Lantern, which was used in the early 19th century to sate the public's fascination with gothic horror and the macabre. And they'd use this lantern to uh, do rear projection to create the illusion of, for instance, a smoky demon appearing and then vanishing with a click, quick flick of the shutter. How about another just beautiful piece of engineering? This is called the Peacock Psyopticon. And the Peacock uh, reference pretty clear. And another poster advertising one of these kind of uh, projection shows called A Day and Night in a Volcano from 1891. Hawaii, the Sandwich Isles. <laughs> what did that ever get called that? <laughs> What's more, some of these uh, lanterns, they really do kind of function as sculptures. So artfully created. <laughs> and look at this, a Buddha lantern. And then right next to it, a Lampadophor lantern. All right, so you've got this Eiffel Tower lantern. They call this a pagoda lantern. Gosh, so beautiful. In the 1920s, scientists found that the human brain perceives motion when shown a series of changing still images in quick succession. The key to this phenomenon are the moments between images when the eye receives no visual information. This groundbreaking discovery led to the invention of a great variety of optical toys and ultimately the film strip. And uh, these are all elements of something called a praxinoscope. These are the praxinoscope strips showing a horse running and it looks like a kid crying <laughs> and of course uh, two figures that are supremely important to the development of cinema france's the lumiere brothers it's a whole corner celebrating their innovations and in some of the films they created way back in the day and these were shot on something called this cinematograph a device they invented you could sort of carry out all the things you needed to do to make a film so it was a camera a projector and a printer all in one you just swapped out parts to uh, do what you needed to do with this single device very cool and when we look at some of this very simple imagery it's important to remember that when people first saw these projections, they were blown away. I think it was one of their films, it may not have been, but the infamous shot of a train approaching the screen and some patrons got up and ran out of the theater, convinced they were about to get run over by that train. <laughs> well, unfortunately, due to uh, current COVID situation, the Oscars experience is not open at this time, but you know, there's so much to see here. I'm not going to get through the whole place anyway, so definitely coming back. So we will return someday to check this out. It may be difficult to leave here without uh, a keepsake, and those Lego Oscars are pretty sweet. <laughs> That's great. Well, I believe to get to the dome, or what is called the Dolby Terrace, you do have to go up one more flight, and it is also closed today at 10 a.m. Another reason to come back.
Okay, there you go. So this is a full-scale model of Bruce, cast from the original mold. 25-foot-long fiberglass model is the fourth and final great white shark cast made from the original mold to use for Jaws. Sweet. So again, no uh, filming of any kind of loud inside the exhibit, but I did take a look at this uh, celebration of Miyazaki's works, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's charming. It's really great. Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service, My Neighbor Totoro, and Spirited Away. <sighs> Three of my favorite animated films of all time. So fantastic. <laughs> oh, maybe the most famous animal to ever have appeared in a film. Discuss. So there is a pretty extensive looking gift store, uh, but there is a line to get in as they are obviously limiting capacity inside the store. So I think we'll check that out another time as well. Well, I love that they call the uh, entrance of the valet parking here at the museum Roddenberry Lane. Nice shout out. And now we can take a bit of a better look at the massive dome. And I'm now pretty sure that this building houses the uh, Geffen Theater where they do screenings and that sort of thing. And then up above it is that uh, Dolby Plaza, which we can't get into right now. But it is a very distinctive structure here. And join some of the other cool buildings that make up this cluster of museums here in this uh, Miracle Mile section of Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. And once more, when conditions are better and more of the museum is open, we'll come back on down. All right. I think that is going to bring this one to a close. So, as always, thank you so much for coming along and uh, hope you enjoyed this kind of look around one of LA's, if not LA's newest museums, which uh, I'm totally in love with. Definitely going to be spending more time here. I have to inquire about a, uh, a membership. But uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff here. And once more, if you, uh, if you are able to come by and see it, do check out the Miyazaki exhibit. Hopefully the Oscar experience will be back up and running soon. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be spending more time here for sure. So take care and we will catch you in the next one. Yep, gotta check out the views up there someday. Bet they're pretty great.